Hi everyone, I'm Adam, and this is part three in the Commodore 64 games cartridge series. My PCBs have arrived. Let's get building right now. And of course, a massive shout out goes out to PCB Way who have sponsored this video and manufactured these PCBs for me. Let's take a look at some of their services right now. Standard PCBs, typical for most home projects. Advanced PCBs, for projects requiring higher board specifications. Don't want to be rigid? Then get flexible with a flexible PCB. Did you know PCB Way can also assemble your PCBs? It's not all about PCBs. 3D printing in a range of technologies is also available. Along with CNC milling and turning. PCBWay.com Let's start by opening the PCBs. The edge connector has turned out really well. I think this looks really nice in blue. If anyone ordered a different colour, I'd love to see a picture of it. Tweet a picture and tag me in the tweet at iNimbleSloth along with at PCBWayOfficial. OK, let's make a start. It's best practice to start with the lowest profile components, so I'm going to solder the diodes in place first. Remember that diodes need to be inserted the correct way around. To do this, the black line on the diode needs to be aligned with the line on the silkscreen. Here, you can see that the black line on the diodes is to the left of the PCB and matches the silkscreen on the board. Right, the resistor next. Resistors can be inserted either way around, but I always like to insert them with the tolerance band on the right hand side, since this is the order in which you read the colours, from left to right, and the tolerance is always read last. Next, I'll move on to the IC holder. Notice the small notch on the silk screen at this end. This matches the small notch on the IC holder itself and they should be aligned with each other when inserting the IC holder into the PCB. A tip for soldering these into place is to initially solder just two pins from opposite corners. Then take a quick look at the IC holder and make sure it is still flush against the PCB. If it isn't, you can then easily heat either of the joints and reposition it. When you are happy with the position, proceed with soldering the rest of the pins. OK, looking good. Next, I'll solder the reset button. Again, I recommend initially only soldering one or two of the pins and checking it is still flush to the PCB before soldering the remaining pins. Great, let's get the jumper soldered into place next. These are the trickiest components to fit nice and straight. They are also the easiest to burn yourself on, since they are only metal pins. I recommend just soldering one pin first, and then, if the jumper is not level, you can heat the joint and manipulate it until it is. Be extremely careful when doing this. I'm adjusting it by holding the plastic jumper, as the pins will burn you if you touch them. You could also use a small pair of pliers to hold them. Nice, just the capacitor to do now. The capacitor used in this project can be installed either way around. So, with all of the components fitted, next I need to clean the flux off the back of the board. I'm going to use this flux remover. This is really nasty stuff, so you should only use in a well ventilated area and of course thoroughly wash your hands afterwards, which is the same thing you'd be doing after soldering, right? Fantastic, the board is done. Next, I'll show you how to convert the CRT game files into bin files so that they can be burned to the EEPROM. Head on over to this website, the link is in the description, and download the latest stable version of Vice. Vice is a Commodore 64 emulator, but we won't be emulating anything with it. It comes with a tool that we can use to convert the CRT game files to bin files. Once downloaded, extract the zip file. Then navigate to the bin folder. and it is this executable that we need, cartconv.exe. 
Copy this to a folder of your choice. I'm going to place it in a folder that's in my project folder. Now we need to find some 16K games to convert. There are lots of old games for the Commodore 64, but did you know that there are many new ones? I love this game called Doc Cosmos. It was awarded free 64 game of the year in 2019. You can download it here and again the link is in the description down below. I've already got this game so I'll paste the CRT file into the same directory as cartconf.exe. And I need to stress that these games must be 16k games, no larger. I know the CRT file shows a 17k in Windows but that's due to some extra file formatting information within the CRT file and this will be stripped out when we convert it to a bin file. Then. To convert this to a bin file, you'll need to run Windows Command Prompt. On Windows 10, hit the Windows key and type CMD. On Windows 11, which is what I'm using, hit the Windows key and type Terminal. Then, we need to navigate to the folder containing both the game and cartconv.exe. To confirm the contents of the directory, on Windows 10, type DIR. On Windows 11, you can use either DIR or LS. Brilliant, now we can convert the file. Start typing CART, and if autocomplete is enabled on your machine, you can then press the tab key like this. Then space, minus I for input, then space, and DOC with a tab to autocomplete, then space, minus O for output, then space, and the file name that you want to save the bin file as, so I'll call this doccosmos.bin. Hit enter, and boom, the conversion is complete. If it didn't work for you, check for typos. Also note that the dot backslash isn't needed if using Windows 10. Repeat this for your other CRT files. Remember, the cartridge can store up to four 16K games. Great, let's move on to burning the EEPROM. Connect your favourite EEPROM programmer to your computer and insert the EEPROM, paying attention to the direction you inserted. This will usually be marked on the EEPROM programmer itself. Next, open your favourite EEPROM programming app. I'm using XGPro, and the first thing I need to do is select the EEPROM that I intend to use. I'm using an AT27C512R with a DIP28 package. If your EEPROM is from a different manufacturer, then choose accordingly, but either way it will be a DIP28 package like mine. Now we need to load the bin files we wish to burn, so click the load button and browse to the location of the bin files on your machine. I'm going to select .cosmos for the first game, and then click the open button. For the first game, the rest of these settings can be left default, so click OK. Now, if I scroll down a bit, you'll see where the data stops and our next game is going to be written to the memory location starting at 4000 hex. So click the load button again, browse to the location of the next bin file and here I'm going to select neutron.bin and click open. This time however we do need to make some changes to these settings. We need to change clear buffer to disable or we'll lose the data from the previous game and of course we need to change the start address to 4000 hex and then click OK. And again, if I scroll down a bit, you can see where the data for this game ends, so the start location for the next game will be 8000. And you can see a pattern here. Each game's memory start address is moved on by 4000 hex from the previous game. So let's load the next game. And I'm going to select powerglove.bin. This time, the start address is 8000 hex and of course, disable the clear buffer option. Then load the final game. So here I'll select supergotron.bin. Again, set the clear buffer to disable, and this time the start address becomes C1000 hex. If you've not worked in hexadecimal before, this can seem a little strange. In hex, there are more than the standard 10 digits 0 through 9 that we're used to in everyday life. There are actually 16 digits that run 0 through 9, then A through F. So if we count 4 on from 8 in hex, we actually get C, hence C1000. Right, I'm ready to burn these to the EEPROM, so from the menu I'll select Device and then Program. 
This is a nice little feature in XG Pro. It actually shows us how the EEPROM should be inserted into the programmer. So double check and yep, I'm good to go. All I need to do is click the program button. Great, success. Next, fit the EEPROM into the IC holder on the cartridge. Note that the legs on new ICs are often angled outwards and you may need to bend them slightly for the EEPROM to fit. One way to do this is to place the EEPROM sideways on a hard surface and apply slight pressure as you rotate it like this. When inserting the EEPROM, ensure that the notch on the EEPROM is aligned with the notch on the IC holder and the silk screen. Before plugging the cartridge into your Commodore 64, it's really important to take some time to carefully inspect all of the solder joints and make sure that there are no shorts. So here we have an original Commodore 64 in all its yellowed glory. And if we take a look at the rear, and let's get some light in here. Here you can see the cartridge port, which we designed the cartridge to fit into. So let's get this cartridge now. Here it is. And for this demonstration, I've selected Neutron. So to do this, I've set the second gain. So that is jumper number one to high and jumper number two to low. Then we can insert. And connect up the peripherals and then we're good to go. And next, let's get the joystick connected. So this goes into control port two. Next is the power. And finally, let's connect up to the TV. And that concludes the Commodore 64 16K cartridge series. Now, I really hope you enjoyed it. Don't forget to subscribe to see when new videos like this are made available from myself. And if you fancy grabbing some of these PCBs without running through the design process yourself, I've actually uploaded the file to pcbway.com's community project area. So you can hop on there. The link is in the description down below and you can purchase some of these and build it up yourself. Thanks very much for watching. As always, Take care.